There are three potential reasons why your photos are not sharp. Number one, blur due to motion. Two, miss focus because you're not using the most optimal focus point. And three, your ISO is too damn high. Now, each of these different causes require different solutions to fix. So it is important to be able to identify why your photo is not sharp because it will be the fastest way that we can start correcting it on the spot. By the way, a special thanks to Professional Photographers of America for sponsoring a portion of this video. More on that later. Now, to avoid taking blurry photos, we will need to understand how to use shutter speed. And that will require us to be in manual mode on our camera. Don't worry, don't freak out. I'm gonna make this super easy to understand. Shutter speed is just how fast the camera takes the shot. Depending on the circumstances, using a slower than necessary shutter speed will be the cause of blurry photos. But what does that even mean? Slower shutter speed? Well, the best way to understand it is through visuals. So let's go ahead and be in the camera. Watch as I'm dialing the shutter speed to the left. As you can see, there's a lot more blur happening as we go down in number to the point where I'm becoming a slow moving ghost. Keep in mind, the shot is also getting brighter as we move to the left. Vice versa, as we dial to the right, there's less and less blur to the point where you can pause the frame now and see that I'm frozen in action. Keep in mind, as we move the shutter speed to the right, the shot is also getting darker. The point I'm trying to illustrate here is, as we're moving to the right, you can see that we're able to freeze the action of our shot. That's the thing that you need to keep in mind when you want to avoid blur in your photo. There's actually a golden rule to shutter speed, otherwise known as the handheld rule, cause you know, you're shooting handheld, your shutter speed must match the focal length you're shooting with if you're shooting with a full frame sensor camera. For you APS-C crop sensor users, double your shutter speed. For example, if you're shooting with a 50 millimeter lens, your minimum recommended shutter speed should be one over 50. If you're shooting with a crop sensor camera with a 50 millimeter lens, your minimum recommended shutter speed should be one over 100. Now that's just the baseline to keep in mind. So let's go ahead and build on top of this rule. If you're moving around a lot or your subject is moving around a lot, then you should use a faster shutter speed. For example, if you're photographing kids or pets that are just moving around a lot, then you might wanna shoot at one over 125 or one over 250 of a shutter speed. My suggestion is take a couple of shots first and check your focus. If the shots are still looking blurry, then raise the shutter speed. Now, the question that you might be asking is, what if you're using a zoom lens? Do you need to constantly keep changing your shutter speed every time you zoom in and out? And the answer is no. For example, let's just say you have a 24 to 70 millimeter lens, right? You'll wanna choose the shutter speed uh, best for the longest end of your lens. So for 70 millimeter, you would probably use one over 180, one over 100, or if you found one 125 works for you, then just keep it there. So even when you're retracting down to 50 millimeter, 35 millimeter, or all the way down to 24 millimeter, you stick with that one over 125. It's just gonna make everyone's life so much easier. Moving on to understanding aperture, and don't worry, I'm not gonna tell you to stop down at f5.6 just so you can nail focus on your shot, okay? You can keep shooting at f1.8 to maximize your background blur. However, have you ever wondered why your camera seemingly misfocused despite you shooting at the proper shutter speed and your camera telling you that you've nailed focus on the shot. Now, the other videos that I've seen, they don't really illustrate this in this video, so I'm gonna do my best to explain how aperture and shutter speed can affect the focus of your image. When we're taking photos, we're only seeing what's in front of us through the lens. And depending on the aperture that we're shooting in, it can affect our depth of field. Going back into the camera, Lowering the f-stop to the widest possible on your lens will yield shallow depth of field, so you'll get that blur, that bokeh. And as you can see, when we widen up the aperture of our lens, we're allowing in more light into the sensor, thus making our shot brighter. On the other hand, when we're increasing our f-stop, it produces greater depth of field, so more things will be in focus. On top of that, when we are increasing our f-stop, we're actually closing down on the aperture, Thus, less light is getting into the sensor, producing a darker shot. But when we hear that phrase, shallow depth of field, like, what does that even mean? What does that even look like? You see, it's hard to conceptualize depth. We're only really seeing what's in front of us through the lens. And it took me years to understand this back when I first started learning how to use a camera. What I said made sense, but it never really clicked with me until I started looking at things from a 2D, bird's eye view, top-down perspective. 
that's when depth of field really clicked with me. Come here, I'll show you. For example, F1.8 versus F8. This thin line right here represents F1.8, which is quite fitting because you get a thin depth of field. So even the slightest movement, if you're accidentally rocking back and forth with your camera, could cause misfocus in your photo, even when your camera tells you you locked on in focus. Versus this thick line right here that represents F8, you have a greater depth of field. So even if you move back and forth a little bit, there's a hard chance for you to misfocus because that depth of field is so great. So in this F1.8 situation, my advice to you is to be in autofocus continuous, raise the shutter speed, and be in burst mode. That way you can be bam bam and land a photo with the focus tack sharp on your subject. By the way, if you guys are enjoying this video and you're looking for more resources on becoming a professional photographer, definitely consider becoming a member with PPA. PPA stands for Professional Photographers of America. They have an expansive library of online education to really level you up as a photographer, but not only on how to use a camera, but also running a photography business. Things like contracts and copy right because those things still go over my head and they have resources that help you understand that a whole lot better. On top of that, if you become a full member with PPA, you also get a $15,000, am I reading this right? 15, oh my gosh, $15,000 equipment insurance policy. Oh my God. As well as a members only discount codes on big name brands. What I've been really enjoying with my membership is that they send these monthly magazines that I just love to flip through and see some new creative photography and understanding the inner workings of these other professional photographers right here. To learn more about PPA, or if you want to sign up, check out the link down below to save $25 off your membership. Thanks so much for listening. Now back to the video. So moving on, choosing the right focus point. This is going to be the biggest reason why that one part of the image that you need in focus is not in focus. Using the wrong focus area or using too general of a focus area would be the culprit of this issue. Now, by default, most camera out of the box will be shooting with the widest focus area. And when you're shooting with a wide focus area, all your focus points are activated. The camera will not be sure where or what exactly to focus on, and it will grab focus on whatever stands out the most at that second. This is where you will need to take that extra few seconds to choose a smaller focus point and get it to where you need it to be for the camera to focus on. And depending on your subject and how far away it is, narrowing it down to the smallest focus point will ensure that you get the best pinpoint focus results. For example, if your camera does not have continuous eye autofocus and you're shooting portraits, use the smallest focus point possible and put it right on your subject's eye. This will avoid the issue where the camera would accidentally focus on their nose or that strand of hair by accident. The last thing that we need to talk about on this list is watch your ISO. High ISO can be the cause of the grain and that mush that you see in your photos, which can be the reason why your images are not sharp. So definitely check out my low light photography guide after this video to achieve the best low light results. But in case you need a refresher, raising the ISO digitally brightens up the image you're about to take but pushing this too hard in a dimly lit situation could yield mushy results. Unlike shutter speed and f-stop, when we're moving the ISO to the left, it's actually darkening our image, whereas when we're moving it to the right, it's gonna brighten up our image. You would be using ISO to compensate for the lack of light to achieve proper exposure in your shot. So I see this issue a lot on Facebook. So-and-so got the most expensive camera with the state-of-the-art lens, and they take a test photo in their dark living room, wondering why their image looks so terrible. And they post on these groups, right? And typically, I see that they're shooting in some type of auto mode, so their shutter speed's all jacked up, one over 1,000, and that in turn causes their auto ISO to shoot up to 256,000 to compensate for that lack of light. Now, there's no shame and asking for help, right? I just wanna be clear on that, right? That's how we spread good information to newbies out there. However, this also goes to show that it doesn't matter if you own the most expensive equipment out there, the camera is not gonna be smart enough to take the photos that you wanna take. So the golden rules for ISO to maintain a clean, sharp image is if you're shooting with a full frame sensor camera, try to keep it under 6400 ISO. If you're shooting with an APS-C crop sensor camera, try to keep it under 3200 ISO. Now newer cameras, of course, can push past these suggested limits. So definitely I would advise to play around to see what the highest ISO that you're comfortable with. 
And if your camera has this feature, go ahead and set the ISO limit to not exceed a certain point when you're shooting with auto ISO. Now I shoot in auto ISO all the time. There is no shame in that because I know when to get out of it to get the best results that I can. All right, so combining everything that we've learned in this video, the next time you're out, put your camera in manual mode, set your aperture value first, then apply the shutter speed rule and adjust if you need to. Be in auto ISO with ISO limit set or put the ISO to manual and just make sure to keep it under your limit. Start at 100 first and raise it if needed. Now, if your image is starting to look too bright, dial down the ISO. And if you can't dial down the ISO anymore, go ahead and raise the shutter speed until you have the proper exposure. Remember, when we are moving the shutter speed to the right, we're also darkening our image. Next, make sure you're using the right focus point and take your shot. Boom, easy peasy. Tag me on Instagram at Jason V Media. All of the beautiful sharp photos that you'll be getting after watching this video because that will let me know that there, that there are people out there that, that cares about me and my content. Thanks guys. Thanks so much for watching. All right. Have a happy 2021. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.